Okay, why don't we get started? Again, my name is Michael McFaul, the director of the Freeman Svogli Institute for International Studies. Thank you for joining us for this special seminar. We don't do these normally, but we do them for special people and special occasions, and that's what today is. Um, uh, Dr. Tom Finger is here to talk about his brand new book. Here it is, uh, From Mandate to Blueprint, Lessons from Intelligence Reform. Um, and I have written some books, uh, and I want to underscore for those of you who have, have not written books, they are really hard things to accomplish. It takes a lot of focus. It takes a lot of attention. Um, and they only will get written in the future, important substantive books like this one that Tom has written, uh, if you continue to buy them. Because if you don't buy them, then publishers won't be um, uh, incentivized to publish them. So. Uh, I'm going to tell you right now to buy this book. Uh, it is a very important read and a deep dive on a very important subject, not just from the past, but for the future. You're going to hear about that in a minute. Um, and then I'm going to tell you one more time at the end of the <laughs> end of our talk, buy this book so that these kinds of books get uh, written. Uh, Tom, as I just was talking about, Tom, I believe we just did a book event with you just a few months ago, uh, a book about China that you did with uh, Professor Gene Oi. I can't believe you have another book. Uh, maybe you'll tell us how you managed to do that uh, in your opening remarks. Um, but just to remind everybody, Tom is the Shorenstein A. Park Fellow here at uh, the Freeman Spogli Institute. Uh, a. Park is one of the centers, uh, uh, the, the several centers that we have at FSI. Uh, his book is based on his experience in government and explains the challenges facing today's government officials who must translate their ambitious goals into concrete policies. Tom has a long record of uh, service in the U.S. government. Uh, my talking points here only have a few of the highlights, just so you know. Um, but it does include, as I, I'm, I'm sure he'll talk about in his opening remarks, uh, serving as the first deputy director of national intelligence for ana analysis and concurrently as the chairman of the National Intelligence Council from 2005 to 2008. He also previously served as the assistant secretary of the State Department's Bureau of Intelligence and Research. I hope he'll explain all those differences to you uh, when we hand the microphone over to him, as well as the director of the Office of Analysis for East Asia and the Pacific and chief of the China division, among many other leadership roles. Uh, so Tom, again, congratulations on the book. Uh, we are uh, eager to hear why you wrote this book, what's it about, what are the lessons? Congratulations, and thanks for being with us today. Uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, let me begin by framing the book with a little more about the uh, career challenges that, uh, that led me to write it that in 2004, the, uh, a concatenation of events, uh, the report of the 9-11 Commission on what had gone wrong that led to the 9-11 attacks and not, not being detected and prevented, and disillusionment, dismay, anger, at the course of events in Iraq uh, that were linked to bad intelligence analysis uh, in the narrative of the day about weapons of mass destruction. And the intelligence community was singled out for the bulk of responsibility uh, I looked at it different way, that uh, there's a common saying in Washington that there are only two possibilities. There are policy successes and intelligence failures. And 9-11, according to 9-11 Commission was a system-wide failure. Many, many executive agencies had performed uh, badly, including the intelligence community. But in the case of the now gone bad uh, invasion of Iraq, that was blamed more explicitly on an intelligence assessment about weapons of mass destruction. Fixing all the problems in the U.S. government was too big a task to take on in the midst of shooting wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and the war on terror. 
So the magic bullet solution was going to be fix the problems of US government national security policy making by fixing the intelligence community. Uh, there's a long story in the run up uh, that I won't go in that's detailed in the book about the interaction between the Bush administration and the Congress and both Congress and the Bush administration and the 9-11 commission members. But the outcome of that uh, was the passage in December of 2004 of the Tele Intelligence Reform and Terrorism Prevention Act, which mandated a number of changes that together constituted the largest reform of the US national security establishment since 1947. This was a, a big task that I don't think anybody fully understood exactly how big it was. I became one of the stuckies to implement this legislation and to implement 74, I think it was, uh, recommendations from the Weapons of, Mis of Mass Destruction Commission, especially appointed like the 9-11, that had been uh, endorsed by President Bush. That uh, I'll be happy to talk about why I think I was the one tapped for this, but a part of it was uh, certainly that the Bureau of Intelligence Research uh, or INR which judged to have been less wrong than other intelligence components on the Iraq weapons of mass destruction estimate. When I returned to Stanford in 2009, I was urged to write about my experiences in setting up a new agency. Uh, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence is a cabinet level agency. Uh, and I was involved in establishing that and in establishing the subcomponent uh, devoted to analysis. So there was a, you ought to write up what you did, tell the story um, that uh, whether it's an interesting story or not an interesting story, it, it should be told. Um, I was going to do that uh, and I was gonna do a little more. I was gonna write what I did or what we did and try as a returned academic to compare it to what sort of the literature on organizations and organization change and team building and so forth said was the right way to do it. Because when I went through the process, there was absolutely no time or opportunity to check into academic literature or case studies. And I'll explain that in a moment because I did other things. I got interested in writing a, a different book about intelligence. I then wrote or edited three books on China. As I was thinking about going back to this book, I realized that really there's greater interest on the part of others and, a, and my own on why I did the things that I did uh, than I was in the what or how uh, I did things, or we did things together. About a year ago, uh, I began to be more interested in this subject, not simply because I had um, just finished another book with Gene Oy, but what I thought of in 2005, uh, when I undertook this task, as being an unusual, if not unique, set of challenges. Um, it's not every year or even every decade that we set up a new cabinet level committee um, or a cabinet level organization, building a component of the federal government from scratch, dealing with the real time challenges of maintaining support to all of the missions, military and civilian supported by the intelligence community and implementing mandated changes and other changes that I thought and other senior people thought needed to be made that weren't included in the legislation. That what had changed was the 
my perception of the experience and consequences of the Trump administration. The failure to fill positions, the exodus of experienced public servants, the loss of confidence in government and in government employees caused me to think what I thought was a unique experience when I went through it is now going to be nearly universal for new appointees uh, across the federal government and likely to remain so for some time. And this caused me to realize that though it's very exciting to be given the opportunity to uh, lead a portion of the federal government, it's great for ego, uh, it's, it's some kind of a statement about past achievements. But none of these appointments come with an instruction manual uh, to take you from the, I'm very glad to have been appointed. What do I do now? And how do I do it? So this book became one that uses my experience in the intelligence community from 2005 to 2008. As, the, as a case study from which to draw lessons that I believe and I hope will be helpful to new appointees to a wide range of government positions and hopefully beyond that. So let me turn from that background into some of the challenges of making the transition from the mandate to having a blueprint for getting things done and actually getting something done in Washington. And for that, it's important to understand the context. And by that, I mean the appointee must understand the context, must understand what is necessary and what is possible. The flip side of that is making judgments about what isn't immediately necessary or maybe necessary, but it's not urgent. And what really isn't possible under the circumstances and in order to avoid the frustrations and the opportunity costs of pursuing objectives or utilizing methods that should have been identified from the beginning is unlikely to work. A part of the context that we faced in 2005 was that after a couple of months of very high profile debate about what needed to be done to fix the intelligence community debate that bracketed and was a part of the 2004 presidential election. So it had high, high profile. Congress in December of 2004 passed this act. And by passing that act, they thought as Congress normally does that they'd solve the problem. Well, they hadn't. Uh, and as any student of public administration or political science more broadly understands, the devil is always in the details of implementation. And as I thought about this, I remembered a, a book written by a Berkeley professor when I was a grad student at Stanford uh, in, the, in the late 60s and early 70s. And the, the title was uh, Implementation. Uh, how bold ideas in Washington fail on the streets of Oakland. That making that transition from a good idea into something that actually is workable and then making it work is tough. That this was underscored for me when I went for my first meeting after accepting uh, the appointment as the Deputy Director of National Intelligence for Analysis with my new boss, who I'd known um, for many years, but John Negroponte. And uh, at the end of our conversation, which ranged over many things that needed to be done, John pointed at a black, blank whiteboard. And he said, you've got 16 agencies, 100,000 people, and $50 billion, what are you going to do? I thought for a few seconds and said, I'll get back to you, boss. Uh, it was on the walk back from the old executive office building to the State Department 
that I began to ask myself, what in the world have you done? Uh, why would you leave the familiar and comfortable position of assistant secretary in the State Department to take on this ill-defined and clearly very big task? In the thinking about what I was going to do, I decided I need to make an inventory of what tasks had been mandated by the president, by the legislation, what the continuing responsibilities were across 16 agencies of the federal government, the intelligence community, the, what did I need to do, but also what do I need to know in order to build and staff a new agency? There was no existing pool of people uh, who knew standard operating procedures and could keep the new appointee out of trouble. I had to build the staff. Part of the context also was the intense scrutiny that had been leveled at the intelligence community, the very, very sharp criticism uh, for its failings, real and imagined or imputed, the loss of confidence in the quality of work done in the intelligence community. And this criticism and loss of confidence extended quite literally across all of the agencies and all analysts, even though only a few dozen people had been involved in the production of the badly flawed Iraq WMD estimate. So many people were tarred with a brush of incompetence and that led to pretty serious morale problems. Uh, so retention of good people was going to be a, a part of the must do list. A big difference between doing things in Washington and doing things in, in many other places, including Academe, and since uh, we, I'm at Stanford, we're at Stanford, I'll use that as a comparison. Stanford is working very diligently over on the long range vision, has been for a few years and will be for a few years more. I'm not criticizing that. It's a complex and important undertaking that should take time, it should involve lots of consultation. Uh, that possibility doesn't exist in Washington for all kinds of reasons that uh, uh, normal outside term of appointment is four years. Uh, most people are not in senior jobs for that long. But I can illustrate the importance of speed here um, by referring to a meeting that I had with Peter Hoekstra, who was the chair of the uh, House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. I think I had been in my new job three days. Uh, it, was, it was not as long as a week for sure. This was an appointment that had been scheduled when I was assistant secretary, but I decided to keep it even though I was in a new job because he was still on the oversight committee or one of my oversight committees. And he asked essentially the same question as Negroponte, what are you going to do? Well, two days had passed and since my meeting with Negroponte. And I was actually beginning to have some broad ideas, a vision for what I wanted to do. And I sketched that out. And Hoekster replied, well, that sounded pretty good. What did I need from him? I said, I need some time uh, in order to make this happen. I, I need some patience while we work out the details and the mechanics. And he didn't hesitate a second. He said, I can't give you that. As we passed this legislation in December, it's already June and you haven't done anything yet. I pointed out that I'd only been on a job for three days and Congress had not confirmed the Director of National Intelligence uh, until mid-April. Um, so the entire operation had been up, uh, not up and running even conceptually for more than a few weeks. But he was absolutely serious uh, about the need to move quickly. 
uh, and that point registered because I'd been in Washington for uh, 19 years already at that point. The final element about operating in the Washington cauldron is that there are lots of constituencies that have a, an interest in what what is doing, a stake in any changes being made, a necessity for continued support. The intelligence community is a support function. There are lots of cooks uh, who think they know uh, as well or better than you do what needs to be done and how to do it. And there's an almost equal number of critics inside and outside of government in various NGOs and think tanks in the media that uh, are more interested in discovering what's being done incorrectly than they are in uh, spreading information about what is done, being done maybe better. So I looked at the situation and I've got this mix of ongoing responsibilities and new tasks and goals that uh, I thought we should achieve that a once in a couple of generation opportunity to reform and transform major portions of the US government was not an opportunity to be squandered. Um, that uh, the objective had to be do more than the minimum required by law and executive direction. So I thought about what I had and I recalled another reading and actually seminar uh, from graduate school, seminar with uh, Professor Jim March. And he and two co-authors had written something called a garbage can model of decision-making. It was about university administration in which it said the theoretical approach of identifying a problem, identifying alternative ways of addressing the problem, weighing the advantages and disadvantages and resources necessary and so forth, and then making a decision um, was a very nice theory, but didn't have much relevance to the real world, uh, where there are uh, problems in search of solutions, solutions looking for a problem, people looking to be listened to and get in the game, ongoing responsibilities and the like. And that sense of simultaneous movement, the need to figure out sequences of action uh, to ward off unhelpful interference while identifying and utilizing proffered assistance when possible was the situation I faced. That I've narrowed it down or I boiled it down to you know, four principal tasks. One was to implement the legislative and presidential mandates. I knew I was going to be judged on how well I did that, judged by the oversight committees in the Congress and the President's Intelligence Advisory Board by the media that paid attention, by the colleagues in the intelligence community, and by the multiple cabinet secretaries that owned pieces of the intelligence community, had to meet the ongoing responsibilities that we could not shut down uh, in order to make repairs or restaff or reorient, that the literally thousands of customers and hundreds of subjects uh, in the federal government that are supported by the intelligence community on a daily basis, uh, including support to the two wars and the war on terror, um, but also uh, health and human services, commerce department, uh, support to diplomacy, these couldn't, couldn't be taken down. How to restore confidence, restore confidence in the intelligence community as an entity, in the products that it produced. And the loss of confidence began at the top, it began with President Bush. It went down through senior officials, uh, began with senior people in the Congress. And it related to the morale of the workforce. 
if the people and the missions that were being supported did not have confidence, it's kind of hard to be enthusiastic about doing what is necessary uh, to satisfy the requirements of mission. So as I looked at, at these things, I realized I had a number of chicken and egg problems to address. For example, that blank whiteboard had to be turned into an organization chart that somehow would relate to groupings of responsibilities uh, for training, for information sharing, for providing guidance to collectors, um, for managing the president's daily brief, uh, which was also in my portfolio and so on. What, what should the organization chart look like? Uh, after a week, there was one box uh, labeled Deputy Director of National Intelligence for Analysis and nothing underneath. But I had to recruit people uh, in order to staff uh, the upper reaches of an organization and to help build the organization chart. But what did I recruit them to do? I, I didn't have a previously defined job, I said, would you like the job of X or Y, that with the exception of the President's Daily Brief and the National Intelligence Council, uh, pre-existing positions that got moved into my portfolio, um, it was all to be determined. And did I recruit people because they were good and I would figure out what to do and they would help me to figure out how to structure it and kind of draft for the best available athlete? Or did I first need to define specific tasks and organizational boxes and draft the best athlete for that position? Um, again, within the context of, I had to be up and running within days. Um, uh, or I was going to be helped in ways that I would not find very helpful, uh, that the, the pressures of time were so real, that finding the right combination of people, the right way to group and prioritize tasks, and the right way to link them in a larger organization chart that had to be incorporated in another organization chart that didn't exist. The director of national intelligence, when I accepted the job, had more boxes. It had a director, it had a principal deputy, and it had four deputies um, labeled analysis, collection, management, and customer support. And when the first uh, principal deputy, Mike Hayden, um, showed that to me and asked what I thought about it, um, I said, well, it's a start, um, but how the subcomponents I was responsible for would fit into the larger component, which I also shared responsibility, uh, made this a pretty uh, daunting task. It also became imperative, I recognized as I'd been around long enough, to have a better baseline understanding of the responsibilities and capabilities of the agency, 16 agencies. I, I knew generally what they did, uh, that the Coast Guard intelligence community, uh, intelligence components supported the Coast Guard, the Treasury Department intelligence components supported the Department of the Treasury, the Bureau of Intelligence Report uh, uh, and the State Department supported diplomacy, uh, the military service components supported the Marines, the Navy and so forth. But what did they do really? What are the subjects that they are most knowledgeable about? What are the missions that they support? What are their priorities? What is the expertise that resides in those organizations? And that got to, I needed to know something about the 20,000 or so analysts uh, that uh, were spread across these agencies. And I also had to inventory my own authorities and my own personal chips that I could bring into the game. 
And I'll, I'll mention this because they are important. In figuring out what I could do on my own with authorities delegated to me by the director of national intelligence. He had legally assigned responsibilities and some of them very quickly uh, were incorporated in a directive that assigned them to me. Uh, in that area, I had complete authority uh, as well as responsibility uh, as long as they were acceptable to the boss. Uh, other authorities were much more constrained by the need to operate with congressional oversight, with uh, uh, longstanding procedures within the intelligence community that made it hard to get anything done. And one that made me uncomfortable at the time, but I was persuaded and then ultimately recognized was important, was personal capital. That the fact that I was selected for this position had, was due in part, uh, I believe, to the performance of Bureau of Intelligence Research, uh, generally and on the Iraq estimate. But it also had to do with my own reputation, and I don't wish to dwell on that, but to point out two observations from colleagues. Uh, one uh, was ultimately became one of my deputies, John Keefe, who I recruited from the Hill, Hill staffer. Uh, and John said, we can't generate support and understanding for what we're trying to do with your approach. My approach was we got to build institutions. We have to generate support for the deputy director of national intelligence. Um, this is not about Tom Finger. Uh, this is about so to identify everything is to come. And John said, this doesn't work. When I tell him, you need to do this because the deputy director of national intelligence wants you to do it. The response is, what the hell is the deputy director of national intelligence? This is an organization, this is a position that has no history. Uh, in an organization that has no history, that has unclear responsibilities and authorities. He said, but if I say, Tom Finger wants you to do this, your reputation carries enough weight that I at least get people to listen to me. Uh, the other one was a former State Department colleague who shortly after I took the new job uh, said, you know, you've got a reputation to die for in this town. I hope you're using it to get things done. And it's, you know, it's a flattering uh, comment, but in the Washington context, it is really important. Everybody has a reputation. There's only three kinds of reputation, good, bad, or unknown. And bad and unknown are functionally equivalent. So if you've got a reputation, you can use it and need to use it to get things done. I don't want to use it all of the time by talking about it, but let me make a couple more points to illustrate the interaction with the context that is somewhat unique to Washington. One was this need to get my arms around capabilities. We asked, uh, Question, we started, we started with Iraq. So what are you doing on Iraq? We asked each of the agencies, tell us what you're doing. And we got very unhelpful answers. Not because people were trying to stonewall us or be obtuse, because we hadn't asked the question correctly. Nobody had asked the question, um, that kind of question before. And it took a couple of iterations to, uh, you're working on economic, what kind of economic issues for what customers? What mission do they support? And we had to do that for 194 countries and 30 some odd transnational issues. Identifying the expertise of the workforce. And there are a lot of very, very good people in the intelligence community, but I had learned something during my two decades uh, in the State Department and INR, and that can be summarized as pick anybody you want with staffing analytic positions in the US government. They know more about the last job that they had than they do about their current position. 
they didn't get dumb in what they did before when they got promoted into something else or moved into some new set of responsibilities. So tracking expertise, not organizational position, became a critical way of getting at improving capability and therefore improving confidence. Uh, it's worth a little detour here. How do we do this? That predecessors had tried to establish was called the analytic resources catalog, simply a directory of database of expertise. And for different reasons, they had very limited success in establishing this, in part because it looked like a free agents list uh, from which managers could pluck talent uh, that they wanted. But I wanted to get everybody in it. Uh, and I used authorities I had uh, as chairman of the NIC and being in charge of the president's briefing. I said, this is a database of analytic expertise. If you're not in it, it means you think you're not an expert or your boss thinks you don't know anything. And if you're not in it, you're not writing for the president, you're not writing for the National Intelligence Council, uh, and you're not briefing on the Hill. And that turned out to be completely within my uh, authority. My counterpart for management, Pat Kennedy, sort of channeled me and picked up on this in a meeting with agency heads. And he said, one more thing about Fingers database. If your analysts aren't in it, they're not in a funded position. We're gonna reconcile budgets to that database. It didn't take long before I had uh, more than a thousand uh, new additions to that. Bring up another issue. Who's an analyst? That turned out to be a fight. That are collectors analysts. If they're in an agency that does primarily collection, can they be analysts? I said, this is bureaucratic nonsense. I want a, di a director of people who know something. I don't care how they know it. They learned it in graduate school. They learned it in their last position. They learned it as a foreign area officer in the military. Uh, they grew up there. It doesn't matter how they know it. But how are you going to vet them? And I said, we're going to use eBay, reputation. In repu everybody has a reputation. And you can earn a reputation. If you weigh on things and demonstrate you know something, that helps your reputation, people will come back to you. You demonstrate that you're an idiot, people are not gonna call upon you uh, and you will isolate yourself. Um, this turned out actually to be a pretty effective way to do things. Final point, I mean, it has to do with demands to provide a blueprint, a plan. Uh, it, it was only a matter of a few weeks before the vague uh, conversations with uh, Congressman Hoekstra uh, translated in requests from congressional committees, congressional staff, uh, most uh, often from the President's Intelligence Advisory Board. What's your plan? Tell us what you're going to do. And I didn't want to provide a plan. Not because I'm, or not only because I'm stubborn, but I didn't want to be defending a plan. I wanted to be doing things. I knew from common sense and experience that the likelihood of getting it right the first time was zero. And then I could spend weeks or months trying to come up with a perfect design the perfect organizational chart, the perfect staff, um, the perfect sequence of steps. And it was sure not to work. But I had to restore confidence quickly, which meant I had to demonstrate improved performance quickly. I knew going in that the intelligence community was a lot better than its critics maintained. Uh, and the demonstrating quality work was not going to be that difficult. I simply had to persuade people that it was better. Um, and we can talk about that in the question and answer period about how I elected to do that uh, and why I thought it, it worked. But the a decision not to defend a plan um, 
but to defend individual steps uh, and demonstrate continuous movement. My assumption was if people judged that we were making progress, if we judged that the work was better, they wouldn't care how I did it. But if I didn't do anything because I was looking for the perfect approach, I would be correctly hammered for not improving performance. So we came up with a mantra that we followed for four years. Think big, start small, fail cheap, and fix fast. A lot of this was shoot first. If you hit something, draw a circle around it and declare it to be the target. Listen to feedback. Involve people uh, in the decision-making process. That assuring cabinet secretaries down to working analysts, we were not going to undertake major structural changes, even though we had the authority to do so. We were going to improve intelligence community performance by improving the performance of every agency. And we were going to do that by improving analyst performance through a variety of mechanisms. When I took the job, I agreed to stay for four years if I wasn't fired before that. The reasons for that were two. One is I had promised my wife uh, that I would retire from government when I became 63. Because by that point, I would have spent 19 years in senior executive positions, uh, which is a very long time. Um, the other was, if I couldn't create an institution and procedures and demonstrate real transformative uh, improvements in the intelligence community in four years, I ought to get out of the way and let somebody else try. And that if I thought I had achieved those objectives, the process would not be complete without a handover to somebody else to take them to the next step. What this book does is try to identify, codify, explain, translate these into not a checklist, but a relatively small number of approaches that I think appointees to all new agencies could usefully apply and do less floundering than I did at the beginning. So thank you for your attention and Mike, back to you. Okay, Tom, terrific. You've covered a, lots of territory. I now have 18 questions that I wanna ask, um, but we don't have a lot of time. So what I think I'm gonna do, I'm gonna ask a couple of mine. I won't ask all 18, I'll, I'll talk to you another day. Um, and then I'm going to try to aggregate from the Q&A a complete list of questions, and we'll give you one bite at the apple right at the end uh, to do it. Otherwise, we'll never get to, there's some great questions in the chat as well. So, and you can then purposely not answer questions that you don't want to in doing it this way, right? So my first question, this is probably, this is one we probably should do offline or another, we could have a whole other session on this, but I'm interested just a little bit in the mechanics of what what it meant, you know, in terms of coordination between those 16 different agencies. How many times did you meet? You had, you, you mentioned deputies meetings. Uh, you know, uh, that's just interesting to me because it was out of the blue. Number two, this is an obvious question, but I, I feel compelled to ask it. Um, you left in 2009. The structure has now been in place for quite a while now. How are you evaluating it since? Um, you know, what, what value added did we get from this uh, reform? Uh, I was just on a, in a meeting literally yesterday with a former senator who had voted for the reform. I'm not going to name him, but uh, he said that was a mistake, that he wished that they, we didn't have DNI. That, that did not lead to new value. Uh, so I'm curious, you know, again, 30,000 feet, we could spend mm -hmm. hours on that topic. But how do you think it's going so far? Three, you teased at this, and I just can't resist from hearing just a little bit more. You know, what you were just saying about analysis versus collection also made me think about, you know, policy maker versus a member of the IC. I look at you and listen to you, and I think, you know, how could Tom Finger sit in a room 
and just be part of the intelligence committee uh, community. Uh, he's not supposed to be a policymaker. Uh, I know that you know a lot about policy, Tom, and have lots of views about policy. How do you? How does that really work? Do you think? Uh, you know, a, fr a colleague of ours is new, the new head of CIA, Bill Burns. I worked with him in the government. It's hard for me to imagine that suddenly he just turns off his policy uh, thinking. And then political and non-political with that. You write about that a bit in your book, but how do you see that balance? So I, I'm gonna stop on my list and just grab a few more from the chat. Uh, I knew it was gonna come up and so I have to at least put it here, but what made INR less wrong on Iraq WND and what made other intelligence branches less right? I think that gets to some of the earlier things you were talking about. Uh, several questions here, both uh, locally and from as far as Russia, about what you see is the role of artificial intelligence and new technology uh, in terms of changing how we uh, do uh, um, intelligence, generally speaking. Questions about diversity, inclusion, and social equity in the intelligence community. Oh, that's a big, hard one, I know. but. And I better stop there. If we if we get through that list, uh, I'll go through the rest. So take pick and choose as you see fit. Okay, I'll try to I'll try to uh, uh, do a lot, and therefore will be very brief. How to integrate the sixteen agencies? That uh, uh, part of it was parish calls, um, you know, multiple trips to the agencies that started very early um, with the purpose of being transparent about what I was going to try and do um, to uh, elicit from them uh, suggestions of what needed to be done, how to do it, to, to make clear that uh, I and then institutionally we were open to engagement. I established uh, or uh, repurposed actually something that uh, had existed previously uh, intelligence analysis and production board um, and made this a vehicle like listserv for communicating simultaneously with everybody, met with them at least once a month um, for, for feedback, for criticism, for suggestions, for best practices exchange uh, and, and the like. And more importantly, by making, you know, this was mandated in the um, intelligence reforms, the president's daily brief, a community rather than a CIA product. Uh, and by changing the, the uh, by responding to the making of the national intelligence community uh, responsible for supporting national security council principles, cabinet level meetings and deputy cabinet level meetings had to reach out to agencies, creating the mechanism, some of more communications mechanism, getting the uh, IT systems linked up uh, together uh, so we could do that. How's it going now after, I don't know, it's mixed. That I think one of the reasons I was tapped was I testified against creating the DNI in my confirmation hearing for assistant secretary. It was straight bureaucratic politics. I yeah, I saw that in your book. That really jumped out at me. That was yeah, really that, a great uh, story. I didn't need another boss. Uh, that I, I, had, I had previously been assistant secretary appointed by President Clinton. Um, in the Clinton administration, INR had two bosses, as secretary of state and the director of central intelligence because that was a cabinet position. Um, I didn't want to do that. So I testified against it to give more authority. Uh, therefore, I was not as zealot. I think that's one of the reasons I got uh, tapped to do this. But I think some of what we did to integrate is, is invisible. Uh, when I assumed a position, the community had been struggling for nine years to connect up the IT systems across all of the agencies. And the IT guys always say, we can do this, we can do this. It's not a problem, it's secure. And the uh, counterintelligence people always said, yeah, but it wouldn't be prudent. Um, if somebody gets into that, they get everything. Uh, we had a mandate to integrate. 
the way, again, how things worked in Washington. Negroponte uh, had a brilliant solution. He appointed the same guy, um, General Dale Meyer Rose, to be the chief uh, this, uh, response, chief responsible for the IT systems, but he also made him in charge of IT security. So he may have been conflicted, but we did get decisions. And while Dale was wrestling with this, I had to make the PDB, President's Daily Brief, a community. I needed a way to share what had originally been on a small separate land within the CIA into something I could link across agencies. And I won't go through the, how I actually made that happen, but I made it happen. Uh, and then was able to say, if we're moving the president's daily brief on this system, it sure as hell secure enough to move everything else on it. So we got, that's permanent. Another was establishing what I dubbed a community of analysts, where analysts would work together because they realized they needed divisions of labor. They needed to tap expertise. Um, uh, you know, part of the, the argument for it was a simple fact. At the point I took over, the uh, average time on account intelligence committee was less than three years. Uh, this gets to the why did INR do so well. When I left INR, the average time on account was in excess of 15 years. Uh, but I said, you know, average time in the community is less than three years. The president at that point had been on the job for more than four years. I said, you need some help here uh, if you don't want to look silly. Analysts were able to work for it because of technical reasons. They were able because we made some procedural changes on access to databases and sharing information. Um, and we said, we don't need to have agency approval for this. This isn't uh, Treasury cooperate with the Army. This is analysts here uh, uh, cooperating, collaborating. And we set up something that made that very easy and very effective, and that's still in place. The fights over uh, authorities uh, between CIA and FBI principally continue. Um, the most problematic things for us, and I think still, are functions that were dumped into the DNI by the legislation that don't belong there. They're housekeeping functions that should be farmed out, but they're an endless source of fights and problems uh, about uh, who, sh who should do it. And finally, I think the uh, high level politicization in the Trump administration um, uh, deserves criticism, undermines the system, but the basic solid foundation, uh, the training of analysts, the cooperation, the quality of production, the vast majority of the activity that never makes it to the top of the system, I think it's held up pretty well. Uh, and I think it is better than it, than it was. Policy versus IC. Um, this, this is a, a tricky one uh, you, because um, you leave your policy preferences at the door um, in the intelligence community, whatever the position. But the director of national intelligence is by law a statutory member of the National Security Council. He's a policymaker. Um, so he's supposed to represent the community and be a part of the policymaking process. That does not apply to the deputies who could maintain more of this. Um, I, I will describe the situation as we analyze it and then not participate in the decision on what to do with it. Uh, where that got tricky was when I would represent the boss. You know, I'm at a principal's committee meeting um, uh, as the sitting in for the director who's supposed to have a role. And as many, many other things in, in real life, and say, you know, I, I, the intelligence community does not have a position on this. T finger, uh, if you want to draw it out of me, has a position uh, on it. And you rely on the integrity of it, because that goes on at all levels of the system. Now, you know, lower level analysts inter interacting with a desk officer who says, what should I do? 
and and I won't tell you is not the right answer uh, because you're building teamwork. The political and the non-political, the political, I think I answered that well enough with the, uh, the Trump administration. Why was INR less wrong? A couple of reasons. One of them has to do with, uh, it's the equivalent of making it to the Yankees if you're a professional ball player, um, that that's where you want to be. And that's, um, uh, it has a long tradition of cherry picking the rest of the community leaving people in the job long enough, close interaction with the policymakers they support uh, in the State Department and in the embassies around the world, um, that most of the time they're a part of the we team of the State Department. Only when you bring bad news do you become a part of the goddamn intelligence community in the day in, in this. So it's partly expertise uh, and, and integration. Partly it was good people, uh, good analysts uh, who persuaded, it, it happened to be me. Um, uh, I, was the, I was acting uh, as the assistant secretary uh, at the time that analyst analysis was uh, produced. And we could not go along with the analysis on nuclear, reconstitution of nuclear weapons capabilities. Um, in my 2011 book, uh, I, I talk about that at, at some length. But uh, so it was, we were less wrong on that, we formally dissented. We were just as wrong in the kind of uh, assumptions and judgments we made about bio and chemical. Um, and one, we had no opinion, but we're, I was going to, my name is the one that's on it um, uh, for sitting in the meeting for that bad estimate. Um, AI, new technology, it's not a silver bullet. I don't believe any of these technologies and data mining kind of stuff. The key to successful intelligence support in my judgment is the relationship that the community, which means analysts, because it's the analysts are the ones who interact with policymakers. They have to understand what the policy maker is trying to do what the policymaker wants to know, what the policymaker thinks it's necessary to know, um, uh, when the information is needed. It's to be able to provide information and insight that is timely, that is targeted, uh, that reaches the individual in the way that they like to receive it. Whether you use AI to help understand data or you data mine, that's sort of what comes after the relationship um, where the policy guy is pretty honest about what he or she needs. Um, I don't know all about that stuff or I really don't understand that. And the analyst has to tap the resources across the community to get answers, not just uh, I'm the guy so I'll make it up. That that. Uh, that can work and must work, and the tools are just tools. And finally, diversity, inclusivity. Um, it, it's less of a problem than it used to be. The one complicating factor I will uh, mention, there's, there's no reason not to have a very much broader spectrum of America represented in the intelligence community. It has to do with clearances for people who have relatives living in problem countries. And you know, part of it is, you know, you know, will there be pressure put on the individual American uh, by family uh, members? In the other, but the other is, do we, do we really want to put at risk members of somebody's family by putting, assigning them to positions in the national security enterprise? Uh, in the intelligence community, where either that has to remain a secret and it's problematic or their expertise or language, they can't go to work uh, in a country where their family members may be at risk. Uh, to me, there's no easy answer to these questions. Well, Tom, uh, first of all, let me apologize to the folks that I didn't get to your questions, uh, but that's all the more incentive that you can just get the book and read them and find the answers to your questions. Uh, in uh, Tom's brand new terrific book. Thank you, fantastic presentation. 
This is a really rich book. I hope everybody will go out and buy it. Uh, and we'll see you here next time for our next special sessions of FSI seminars Fridays at one. Thanks a lot, Tom. That was great.